I'm Nancy Ruther, Associate Director of the Macmillan Center, and I am delighted to welcome you all to, we don't know which reunion this is, so it's the first of many in the future. How's that? Um, before we, and Ian Shapiro, our director, will be here tomorrow, flying back from the great state of Ohio this evening, so you will see him tomorrow. And before we got started with the meat of the reunion, I wanted to thank Felicia Spencer and Kathy Sulkis, who have been responsible for pulling this all together. So wherever they are, thank you. So we hope that the events will give you ample opportunity to mix and mingle and get reacquainted with each other or make new friendships and also renew and perhaps quench a little bit of that intellectual curiosity that brought you all to study with us a few years ago, many years ago, or are still studying with us, I guess. Um, let me just give you a few logistics. Tomorrow, breakfast will start at 8.30, and the panels, we hope, will start at 9. And we will have the raffle. If you haven't gotten your raffle ticket yet, you can pick one up upstairs at the registration desk. We'll do the raffle tomorrow at lunchtime at noon. And there are a number of Saturday events that the different area studies councils have arranged to bring you into their particular parts of the Yale world. So I hope you will look for those, sign up for them, or show up at the times that are listed up at the registration desk. If anybody was excited about playing soccer and picking teams for the hegemons and the preemptive strikers, I regret to tell you that they have been struck <laughs> by health problems so that there will not be a soccer game tomorrow. But Brazilian ashe dancing is quite athletic. So is Julia here? Julia Uranaga, can you stand up? Julia can tell you more about that at the reception later on if you want to know. The Yale Journal of International Affairs, the graduate student publication, will be around tomorrow. Is there anybody there from the journal? in the purple sweater. You can look for her at the reception as well. There's an African art tour and treasures of East Asia. Anybody from African studies? No? OK. For East Asian studies, they've got a great set of events planned. Abby Newman standing on the steps. You can look for her. The Gamelan Music Room, that's a South Asian, Southeast Asian instrument, and the tour of the Yale campus. OK. So look for those tomorrow, sign up, and we hope you'll enjoy it, and then end the day with the African chorus and more food and drink throughout the day. But without further ado, I just wanted to turn the floor over to Gustav Ranis, with whom I had the privilege of working for six plus years when he was director of then the Yale Center for International and Area Studies before we had the great good fortune to be renamed the Macmillan Center. And he is the Frank Altschul Professor of International Economics, emeritus now, but still quite active. So I feel very privileged that we were able to get him to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, Paul Kennedy. So Gus, to you. Thank you, Nancy. I think it was eight and a half years, but it seemed like eight, six to you. <laughs> Um, my cup runneth over this uh, afternoon uh, for two reasons. One is that I have a chance to welcome you all back. Many of you came through these portals when I was uh, a temporary landlord of this place. Uh, and the second and more important reason is because I feel honored to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, and the pleasure will be all yours in a, in a little while. Uh, Paul Kennedy is a good example of what's called brain gain. Uh, I won't talk about the drain, just the gain. Uh, Paul came to us from, from England, as you know, uh, in uh, 83, I think it was. And um, uh, he really um, has made a big impact here at Yale. Uh, he is not only the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History and Director of International Studies, international security studies, 
uh, but he's made an impact in terms of his popularity as a lecturer, uh, his impact on uh, graduate students in general. Many of you uh, know about the impact. He's written more than 20 books. Many of the early books were on uh, British dip diplomatic diplomacy of one kind or another. I'm not going to read them all. That would take some of his time. Uh, but everybody uh, in this business is entitled to a home run, and he's had a, a real home run, and a few triples. Uh, the home run, as many of you know, is the rise and fall of the great powers, which went into 23 languages and uh, 2 million copies, uh, probably more by now. Uh, and uh, the way things are going now, he may still be proven right uh, in terms of what happens to the great powers. <laughs> He's being modest. Uh, I remember being in the Hotel Okura, Okura in, in uh, Tokyo uh, during the heyday of this uh, home run of his. And I was, uh, there was a lot of buzzing going on in the foyer. And I said, what's going on? He says, oh, Professor Kennedy is here. And he's being feeded for lunch, and he's giving a talk. And I think this happened all over the world at that time. It was a huge, a huge impact, uh, still reverberating. Uh, and I think that, uh, unfortunately, he may be right. <laughs> he also wrote a triple, preparing for the 21st century, and most recently, another triple, The Parliament of Man. Um, I think these books are both four-sided and far-sided. And uh, the, the honors that have come to him, multiple honors, including uh, being a fellow at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study at uh, Princeton, uh, in, uh, a fellow at the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung in Bonn, many others, which again, I won't enumerate for a lack of time. Of course, we Americans, even though I'm not a native born, I'm aware of the, the special feature of British honors. So I'm, I can't resist mentioning that he's the commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Uh, <laughs> but I, I want to repeat that the biggest honor is the one he's received right here in terms of the acclaim he's received by colleagues and, and, and students, including his work on grand strategy, uh, which has become very popular. He's not just an ivory tower historian. He's also been in the real world. He's uh, worked on UN reform. He's advised uh, President Clinton and Boutros Ghali. He doesn't uh, fit the usual terminologies of liberal or conservative. I would rather say he's a man who fits the title of courageous. Um, I Remember well the Sunday after 9-11, when a few of us were asked to say something about the events. And there were very few of us who dared to say or ask, why do they hate us so much? It was not a popular thing to ask, nor to ask, as he did, what would happen if we were reversed? Everybody was reversed. What would be our reaction then? And I think it was a very courageous thing for him to say. And I think I've seen this before in, in his character. Last, I want to say that there's another side to uh, Professor Kennedy, call it soft power or softness, or I like to think of it as a very nice characteristic. He cares about people who are less fortunate than we are. Uh, he's been involved in kitchen, soup kitchens. Uh, he also has waived many of his uh, speaker fees. I'm sure he's doing the same thing today which is quite a sacrifice. <laughs> um, and in general, I think he's been uh, active on that front, which many people don't know about. Now, when he first uh, gave his title for his paper, there was an, something missing, which is no longer in the title, but I want to mention it anyway. I'll give you the current title, Great Power Rivalries, Transnational Challenges, and Institutional Responses. An earlier version has an added note, it says, a three-legged stool. I think the three legs are from previous books. And I think, unlike many three-legged stools, this one is a very sturdy stool. I think it's not going to fall down. 
In fact, I predict that this is going to be the seed of another book. With that, I'd like to introduce you to Paul Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, thanks to all the staff who arranged this. Uh, Gus, thank you for a very kind, quite excessive introduction. Um, still, you said something which uh, pleases me. Um, we're still in the, I came here 24 years ago, an export of Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, we started the downtown soup kitchen 24 years ago. I'm uh, not happy to report that it was as busy as ever on um, Wednesday lunchtime. But one of the challenges of being at a major research university in a, uh, in a city environment is um, the chance to do something other than what you would do at uh, Princeton or Dartmouth, which is to get into the real world, which is on the streets of New Haven. Much, much better place, incidentally, than uh, many of you here will recall when you were doing your master's programs in the 1980s and 1990s. Incredibly better. Uh, Gus, in his remarks, has actually stolen a bit of my, uh, my first thunder, if that be the word. Uh, what I'm going to try and do uh, in this talk is offer some musings, some ponderings on um, some of the areas, the big areas of international affairs and international studies in today's world. Uh, it may seem a little self-indulgent because it will start off in the next slide with reference to those three works which uh, Gus mentioned the great power rivalries, the transnational challenges, and uh, the institutional responses. But let me tell you a little about the origin of this. I thought I would bring it to you as the second audience of uh, some remarks which I was asked to make to a group of uh, international investors over in LA just about a month ago. Very smart, very intelligent folks. They're managing large-scale uh, pension investment funds, like the University of California Teachers Union Pension Fund. You can just start to imagine how many billions that is. And they have to go carefully. And these were the people in particular whose uh, portfolio was to invest in, in real estate. And they had come to see over the past 25 years that, like, everything else, you, could, you had to put your eggs in different baskets, and therefore they were now increasingly investing in real estate outside of California, outside of the United States. That was their expertise. What they wanted to know was not specifically what any, of course I couldn't say anything about, you know, this section of Shanghai is a better investment bet than that section of Shanghai, but generally how, how would they think about international affairs in the broader sense of the word and in the broader sense of what, what we think we teach in the panoply of courses which are offered under the umbrella of the Macmillan Center and international security studies and political science and other places at Yale. Uh, how, how could one describe the, the forest or the wood for them rather than describing a particular tree or a particular branch? Which is what uh, we academics are really rather guilty of doing, that is over-specialization. Um, we're not alone in that, of course not, but we do tend to over-specialize. You, 
if I go along to the renowned economics department uh, at, at Yale, there will be somebody who is, yes, an economist, but then he or she will say, well, I'm a development economist, and I'm a development economist with special reference to the Caribbean or to Southeast Asia. If I go to talk to my fellow military historians, I will bump into somebody who for the past 25 years has never left the realm of the Anglo-Dutch wars of the 17th century. That's his area, that's his forest. That's really his tree or branch. So I, I was thinking of one way in which I could uh, provoke these executives to think about the difficulty of our describing the funny changing shape of international affairs was to, uh, was to actually go back. Uh, I'm not trying to do this in a self-indulgent or autobiographical way, but to go back to uh, certain experiences I had uh, since I came to Yale in the 1980s. I came, as Gus got it right, I came in 1983 as a Dilworth professor. I was a classically trained diplomatic, military, strategic historian. I was halfway through writing my book on the rise and fall of the great powers. I'd written about five or six or whatever earlier books on Anglo-German relations, on British naval mastery. This was to be the big one, as it were. Um, when it came out, and to my utter astonishment, was seized upon because of the kind of whimsical reflections in the final chapter of the book, which you know needn't have been in from my, the author's viewpoint, but when it was seized upon, became a national uh, bestseller, an international bestseller, because it suggested that the big challenge for the United States and the Soviet Union was how to manage relative decline. The critics have never, ever understood the word relative. Um, I found myself challenged from all different directions, which uh, we, you know, modest and humble academics don't usually get challenged from. Um, uh, having to testify before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee or the House Armed Services Committee, um, going down to a meeting at Brookings, a famous uh, think tank in Washington, before an audience of 200 economists in May 1988 who wanted to debate my ideas about the relationship between economic, technological, power, relative strength on the one hand, and military and great power strength on the other hand. In the midst of um, that evening debate, I well remember an uh, economist getting up and saying, turning around angrily to his colleagues and saying, I don't know why you're bothering with this book. It's just a really, really Professor Kennedy's written a very traditional dead white man uh, account of great power rivalries, state-centered, government-centered. Why didn't he spend the last eight years not on this sort of bore, you know, boring Bismarckian stuff, but on the great things which are happening and t which cross borders, transnational trends, forces, technologies, migration, crime, 24-hour-a-day uh, trading, and the, the other 199 of the economists turned around on this guy, savaged him, and I think may have defenestrated him. I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I didn't know his name. I've never met him. But as I came back on the Amtrak, I started thinking, you know, well, actually, I don't really know much about these transnational trends, forces, developments, which nation states increasingly cannot control. Uh, so being an avid reader of The Economist and The Financial Times and being one of those persons who was taught by my great mentor in military history, Sir Basil Liddell Hart, to mark newspaper articles and then clip them out and put them in files, I started a file called Global Trends. 
Uh, by the middle of the year, my file on global trends was getting so big, I started subdividing it to global demographics, global finance and capital flows, global environmental issues. When my legendary editor from um, Random House, Jason Epstein, said, what are you going to do for an encore? I said, well, I, I, this is going to sound odd to you, Jason, but I think I'd like to write about what this guy at Brookings challenged me to write about. And so I then moved for the next four or five years into the book Preparing for the 21st Century. I, uh, it was a diversion. I wanted to get back to a book on international politics, a book on the Second World War and other things like that, but... Um, we went ahead and it came out in 1993. Uh, when it came out, I was so relieved. File after file of statistics on development, third world, why did, why, why was it that Korea and Ghana had the same GDP per capita in 1956, but 35 years later, Korea had 20 times the GDP. All of that stuff was going into my cavernous basement in the hope that the rats would eventually, you know, chomp it to bits, um, get rid of it some way. Um, and then I got a phone call uh, just after I'd come back from walking in the Lake District. And uh, <laughs> it was from the Secretary General's office and the Ford Foundation to say that... Um, in 1993, August 1993, it was less than two years before the 50th anniversary of the United Nations, signed the charter, if you remember, in June 1945. The UN was under colossal pressure. The number of peacekeeping operations had gone from nine to 19 in three years. The South was complaining because the North was obsessed with security issues rather than development or poverty issues. There was no chance that anybody in uh, the Secretary General's office could handle the possibility of creating a report on the long-term future of the UN. Uh, looking back to see what it had done okay, what it had done badly, what it should get out of, what it perhaps needed more resources on. So the Ford Foundation, which uh, helped the UN in the Falker report, the other Falker report on UN financing, uh, had spotted the brochure which I and Bruce Russett had created on UN studies at Yale. And so the Ford didn't want to do this report. Department of Peacekeeping Operations and the Secretariat couldn't do it. So we were asked to do it. And that was the phone call which came into me. <sighs> 10.31 on Friday morning, the 13th of August, 1983. Um, well, I, when my wife came back from wherever she was, uh, she said, you look a bit uh, dazed. And I said, yes, I, I, I feel a bit dazed. Uh, I've just been asked to write uh, put together an international commission and write a report on the long-term future of the United Nations. And she said, well, you're mad. <laughs> and I said, well, well, I, I, I think I agree. Uh, but uh, I don't think I can turn down as Secretary General of the UN. So I and Bruce worked on this for the next few years, we produced our report, the Yale Ford Foundation report on the United Nations in its second half century. Uh, we brought it along to Boutras Ghali, uh, who by that stage was a man in deep trouble. We were in deep trouble. Gus will remember that in that period where we were trying to think optimistically about the long-term future of the UN, there came a triple whammy of uh, Kosovo, Srebrenica in the Balkans, of Mogadishu, and especially of Rwanda, Burundi. Uh, by November 1994, uh, the Congress had hurtled itself recklessly, in my opinion, to the right 
and the Republicans were in charge of the entire affairs. Uh, 64 of those entering members of the Congress in November 1994 didn't have a passport. They'd never been abroad, they weren't planning to go abroad, they boasted to their constituents that they weren't interested in abroad, and now they were going on the House Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committees. Um, in any case, Butrus Ghali had fallen out of favor with uh, the State Department, with Madeleine, who was desperately trying to get a second term and couldn't see that that just wasn't going to happen. So when we came along with our Yale report on the long-term future of the UN um, and presented it to him with our radical proposals for Security Council membership reform, for scrapping the eco-sulk and replacing it with something else, when we offered it to him, it was like offering him roadkill. I mean, it was like skunk food. He did, just didn't want to see it. He had reneged on his promise to take it to San Francisco in June 1995. And some of us spent about the next year talking to governments in London and Delhi, et cetera, about this. And, and then we put it all in the files. And the, actually, uh, they may be in the basement of this building somewhere in the archives. Uh, I wouldn't advise, I wouldn't bother going to see them, but there they are. Um, I resolved that I'd spent, you might say, wasted three years of my time because I picked up the phone on that Friday afternoon, Friday morning, and uh, so decided to write this book, uh, which came out last year, on the past, present, and future of the United Nations. Now, why am I being kind of uh, autobiographic graphical and uh, self-indulgent. It's because, and without knowing what I was going to talk about, Gus picked it up. Um, the, these represent three of the larger areas of study of international affairs, or trying to understand what's going on in the world. They're not the only ones. M many of you would think, well, there should be a book on um, international human rights. There. there should be a book more on international financial and commercial issues there. But uh, as I've tried to explain to you, I sort of hopped from one book to the other, not exactly of my own volition, but being provoked into the second book and then being requested into the third book. But when I was uh, earlier this week putting thoughts together for this talk, Nancy, it occurred to me it, the trilogy or the three-legged stool, which part of which disappeared from the the, the undertitle, uh, was it, it turned out not to be a bad idea of presenting thoughts and panoramas to the uh, investment executives over on the west coast uh, a, a month ago, uh, because as I said, most of us look at international affairs from our narrow, specialized viewpoint. We're either in security studies, or we're in international political economy, or we're in international organization, or we're in international human rights, or women's issues, the softer agenda, uh, or we're interested in um, the NGOs and international affairs. And what I was trying to convey to them was that, uh, you know, we are all working in, this, in these areas, but um, somehow they do fit together. And if they don't fit together, we're probably in a world which uh, is uh, in trouble. So I, I don't have many PowerPoints to offer you uh, this afternoon. You'll be relieved to hear. Uh, but I thought I would make remarks about the first stool, the this first leg of a stool, the second leg, and then the third leg, Gus, and uh, in a way uh, echoing um, what those three works try to cover, try to do. The first area, therefore, is that of um, the traditional world of the great powers. Uh, one of my favorite um, juxtaposition photographs, I suppose, the, the, uh, the GIs and the uh, Red Army 
infantry shaking hands on the banks of a river, Elba, in early May 1945, at the uh, collapse of the Third Reich. Um, if you like, the culmination point or the apotheosis of, at least in European great power or nation state terms, a culmination of almost 400 years of great power rivalry since uh, Francis the first of France smashed into Italy in the late 15th century, since the formation of the European nation states. Uh, symbolic in another way, as most of you know, because it was the two uh, outlier countries, the two outlier flank powers, which were meeting in the heart of Europe. Uh, the world was moving from one system to another, from a multipolar world to a bipolar world. The uh, the one on the right is, of course, what happens. Here's the optimism. Uh, this is uh, the, the handshakes are occurring while the delegates already in San Francisco in May 1945 are hammering out the final wording of the charter. Uh, but this is just a few years later in Berlin, uh, confrontation time, 1960. Uh, American tanks on one side of the divide, Soviet tanks on the other side of the divide. Came fairly close. But there was nothing unusual to that, which is why you know, people like George Kennan and Henry Kissinger and Brzezinski found this an understandable world. It was the world which they knew about. It's a world in which Kissinger, who wrote about Metternich and Castlereagh, uh, Kennan, who wrote about Bismarck, as well as Kissinger, it was understandable. It was taken to another level. You had the peculiar problem of thinking through the nuclear age, but this was a traditional form of study and of understanding international affairs. And uh, if you uh, think that that area has been obliterated in recent years because of our concern with non-state actors and threats, then I would suggest you go along to the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where um, those guys have China on the brain. Uh, they still think in terms, their, their mental world, in other words, and I was trying to explain this to these executives who were thinking of putting tens of billions of dollars of investment in the Far East, the mental world of our strategic planners at the Pentagon, at the National Defense University, at the Naval War College, is indeed that of how to deal with the next challenger, the next uh, uh, contender for the number one position. So they're getting really fixated by the way in which uh, China has been developing weapon systems, which. Uh, are not directly symmetrical to our large aircraft carrier task groups, but in fact are deliberately asymmetrical. Uh, sea skimming 400 kilometer range uh, missiles, which make no, uh, no US admiral wants to go anywhere close to Taiwan right now in the middle of a crisis. Just far too dangerous. You kind of pick them up on radar, um, they, they, they're doing what my colleague and Gus's colleague, Paul Bracken, would call a strategy of sea denial. India and China are pushing us further and further out. The days of gunboat diplomacy in the Yangtze went away, I guess, in 1949, but they've really gone away this time. Now, this is their mental world. I'm not saying it's my mental world, but we have to understand that in this area of international affairs, there are people who are paid to work day and night thinking of this. This uh, sucker is uh, really interesting. It's, uh, it's a diesel engine submarine with German technology, including uh, technology from Blom und Voss and the, uh, the, the, the uh, Rostock, I think, or Hamburg Werft. In other words, the people who put together the superb German submarines in the last 
two years of the Second World War for the Battle of the Atlantic are now putting together these submarines and the Chinese are buying the technology. Why? Because they are ultra-quiet diesel submarines. Uh, you cannot pick them up. Uh, they're coated with the same technology that we coat our B-1 bombers and our stealth fighters with. Uh, we don't build diesel engine submarines because they're not sexy enough. Uh, you wouldn't get enough profit to Groton, New London, General Dynamics, and the local representatives, all liberal in this state until it comes to defense orders. Um, it, it wouldn't work. So what, what's happening is that these craft can get close to our big warships without us being able to detect them. Even our Los Angeles class attack submarines, the kind of hunt for Red October submarines, can't get clear. So what is happening in, in this dimension, or as Joe Nye would argue, on this chessboard of great power strategic vision of international affairs, uh, nothing much is changing. You're just getting another challenging power coming up to eyeball the leading or the hegemonic power. Nothing new there. Um, what about those other dimensions, though, or the other parts of the, the leg, or the three legs, or the three dimensions, or the, the three books? Um, the transnational challenges the ones I tried to cover in uh, preparing for the 21st century. Uh, of course, this is just a, you know, a, a, a triple illustration, and um, one could put up uh, another 10 or 15 transnational challenges, uh, whether it be poverty, whether it be devastated, uh, burned out uh, Amazonian jungles, uh, whether it could be poor polar bears floating on uh, shrinking ice flows. But I think you can get the sense of this. This is what the Brookings economist was chiding me about in May 1988 that I hadn't bothered thinking about because I was so focused upon great power decision making. I was so focused upon foreign offices and state departments and pentagons. And the pentagons and foreign offices cannot do much about this. This is, uh, this is part of Arizona, which was once a, uh, a wonderful, big, flourishing river, and it's drying up almost as fast as the Aral Sea at the moment. Some of you might recall an uh, incredibly well-timed New York Times Sunday magazine uh, of, last, of last, uh, last Sunday, just before the brush fires and the wildfires on California, the, the big article called The Perfect Drought. Um, the other issues are of the many transnational issues that uh, I tried to point out, and here the international executives were more understanding of it. The, um, the, the incredible interconnectedness and internationalization of global capital flows. These uh, folks are uh, standing, well, I don't know, somewhere in Bradford or Newcastle in the north of England, trying to get their savings deposits out of their Northern Rock building, uh, their, their account with the Northern Rock Building Society, because Northern Rock had decided some years ago it wished to uh, make more money than its traditional investment instruments and uh, change its portfolio, and it put a large amount of cash into, um, into subprime mortgages. Did you like the music? Which one was that? <laughs> uh, dancing on the, on the Titanic, as it were. Um, what did they know about U.S. subprime mortgages in Florida? Nothing. But the knock-on effects went across the Atlantic and are still going all the way around. We, we're still to see some of the results among the European banks of their having over-hastily invested in this instrument, this dodgy instrument. Uh, it brings enormous profits. It brings enormous internationalization. 
uh, brings a lot of a lot of jobs for those in the field, though uh, many of those jobs are now being tossed out in consequence of it. Uh, the internationalization of capital explains that uh, when you go to airports, you just see a certain type of person waiting patiently at the McDonald's, etc., for news of uh, the flight delay, and others going along to you know, the uh, Admiral's Club or the British Airways or the Emirates First Class Club because they are part of this international world. Uh, full of promise, uh, but not much controlled, despite everything which is being done. The most interesting thing to me, I'd be interested to talk with Gus about it later, is that it does seem to me that every report that comes in about stabilization measures, like the three big US banks creating a 75 billion super fund, which the stock market foolishly saw as great news, like the Seventh Cavalry coming, the creation of a super fund is an indication that those guys know much more than we do about how bad the situation is. Ditto the European Central Bank. Uh, the other driver of global uh, trends, a big one that I've chosen out of, as I said, a, 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 you know, a panoply, is the inexorable continued rise of world population, disproportionately occurring in the less developed countries of the world. It's true that the overall percentage population growth rates have been going down, and it's true that some actually remarkable stabilizations have occurred in countries as widely spread as Brazil and in part uh, East Africa. But the fact is uh, that unless all of the demographic experts that we trust um, are wrong, we are going to see the global population go up from its present 6.6 .6 billion to roughly about nine if uh, you go for the higher estimate rather than the median estimate, 10 billion, with 95% of the increases occurring in countries which are under severe strain, structurally, uh, economically, environmentally. Um, so what do we do about it? Uh, w when I used to give talks about preparing for the 21st century, uh, to you know, Yale clubs, alumni associations, and others about all of these big, broad, transnational, global, uncontrollable forces. The most common reaction I got, especially from the Yale alums, was uh, to look at each other after my lecture, or after Q and A, and say, "Jesus, I need a really big whiskey right now," <laughs> uh, because it seemed, you know, so uh, unavoidable. So big, if, if national governments couldn't deal with it, well, who would deal with it? And I guess that's where I come to my third leg. Uh, if national governments cannot deal with these broader forces for change, transformation, some of which may be beneficial, some of which are undoubtedly damaging, then you have to go back to the founding fathers of 1944 with the international financial instruments, at Bretton Woods and to go back to thinking of international security instruments. And as you well know, and as I tried to uh, describe in uh, the Parliament of Man book, uh, the World Society has, not just then, but in many later times and occasions, created a vast array of instrumentalities to try to deal with uh, challenges and opportunities which are by their very nature, by their very nature, are international. Uh, yes, each uh, of the richer countries has indeed an uh, equivalent of USAID. They have um, their own relief agencies. One of my sons is uh, currently employed by the Norwegian Relief Agency. Uh, when I tell friends he's working for the NRA, they, the, the liberal <laughs> friends get incredibly fussed about it. Um, uh, in Somalia, 
uh, you know, Vikings in Somalia. Uh, this is a world that would be inexplicable to people in the age of Bismarck, or people in the age of, uh, you know, er earlier great power leaders, people who understood international affairs to be that of states and principalities. The gamut, as some of you well know, because some of you have worked with them, the gamut of the agencies responding to uh, international crises in that reactive way, the UN peacekeepers there in uh, Eritrea, uh, or the gamut of more positive responses of nation building, uh, such as the ballot boxes there in Cambodia, and going on to the more positive, this is, this is a World Bank photo of World Bank rural literacy programs. I think in, I can't tell where, I think Kerala, or somewhere in, in, in some of the poorer provinces of, of India. This gamut of responses is quite, quite staggering. Um, the number of international instruments we have in, uh, going from the technical agencies, which we rarely think about, uh, because they're just dealing with things that happen every day. International air you know, traffic control, international maritime organization. I, um, for some reason, I, I, I get almost every day an email from the International Maritime Law Institution cited in Malta and um, it's about developments in international maritime law and regulation. And you think, well, wow, you know, what's that got to do with me? Except that you then pick up a Financial Times and discover that 87% of all world traded goods go by sea. And they're responsible for the law of the sea. They're responsible for the insurance policies. They're responsible for... Uh, international agreements on piracy down the East African coast or the Malacca Straits, and you realize, well, we couldn't do without them. Some of the agencies are definitely more political, more controversial, and the whole issue, A, of development aid on the one hand, and B, of uh, peacekeeping and especially peace enforcement on the other, is a story of you know two steps forward, one step back, or as a pessimist would say, one step forward, two steps back. In many cases, the world may be changing such that some of the instruments of 1945 will be less pertinent, less useful. Kind of interesting at this time of the meeting of the Bretton Woods institutions in Washington just a few days ago to see some really serious economic journalists wondering if there was a future life for the IMF because a large number of countries, chiefly boosted by oil revenues, just want to get away from the conditionality strings of the IMF, so that the amount of loans given out by the IMF right now, the total is so, so much less than even 10 years ago. But there they are, the responses. So um, it sounds pretty, um, pretty cozy and it sounds um, in a way as if um, we've managed it. We have a three-legged stool and as many of you know in all of those Grimm's fairy tales and other things like that, three-legged stools are incredibly strong. It's pretty hard to break a three-legged stool. You can put a lot of weight on a three-legged stool. So we have the great power of policies and governments which are still there and massively responsible for what happens to their citizens and massively responsible for international treaties. We have on the second leg down from the stool, we have um, our attempts to understand international change, transformation, transnational issues. But then we have the third leg, which are the institutional responses. Um, so I. I I am going to stop in a minute to uh, go for Q&A. One could just stop here and say, okay, we've got the ABC. The institutional responses actually relate back to the great powers because it's those governments 
which have created the international responses. It's those governments, especially on the Security Council, which have authorized the UN peacekeeping or peace enforcement. Uh, but they're responding to transnational trends like the need for increasing literacy, the need for environmental accords, environmental protection. So everywhere you look at it, those three legs seem to interconnect. It therefore sounds holistic. Um, but I'm, I'm going to end with one final uh, slide because I'm, I'm, I'm actually persuaded that um, there's more still to be done. I, I'm not convinced that what we have here in institutional responses, although I've tried to defend those responses and defend those organizations in the Parliament of Man and lots of my talks, I, I'm not quite sure whether they are going to survive the real big tests of the next 10, 20, uh, 30 years. So I'm just ending with uh, one final cluster of slides. Uh, not so fast, Kennedy. Uh, you have not yet reached your Tennysonian parliament of man. Uh, you have not yet reached your commonwealth of nations lapped in universal law, as Tennyson said in his great 1837 poem, Loxley Hall. Uh, the pressures are coming again. They're coming perhaps faster. They're coming in a broader way. Uh, Security Council has before it at the moment about six possible peacekeeping, peace enforcement, new mandates to consider. Uh, even the countries which have had a wonderful 65-year track record or 60-year track record of support for peacekeeping are showing donor fatigue. And donor fatigue these days means not just donor fatigue of the sort that Gus and I understood when the word came out in the early 1990s about fatigue and giving money for peacekeeping or development. The donor fatigue is in providing contingents of men and women uh, for UN operations or police work or anything else like that. So this is what I tried to tell the um, executives. Uh, it was rather surreal, but not too often. I know Gus does this all the time, but it's not too often I'm you know, sitting in this uh, luxurious uh, seminar room in a Beverly Hills hotel uh, saying hi to Schwarzenegger as he goes by in the other direction. Um, well, this is what I was trying to tell them, that uh, in our world of describing, studying, analyzing international affairs, we have all become specialists. We have to. But on the other hand, every so often, if we try to describe what's happening in our world, our world of study to those who are not in our world of study, we have the same intellectual obligation as an international investment banker would have to describe to us what is the landscape and what is the shape, what are the challenges and what are the different aspects of uh, his world of international banking. So I, this is my report in, as it were, from talking to the real estate investors, but I, it seemed to me to fit as an address to uh, you all coming back to Yale, and we're grateful that you have done and are doing, coming back to Yale, but uh, coming back after you've had the opportunity of thinking about these uh, larger intellectual and global challenges. But perhaps it was worthwhile offering this to you because as you marched on from your master's degrees and your PhDs, you too were forced by the pressures to to focus on a particular part of the forest and the wood, and sometimes to forget the shape of the overall structure of that environment. And the reason why Nancy and Gus and others offer these renewal sessions is to give you a chance to get away from trading desks or wherever you are at. And to, uh, and to discuss and think about the, uh, the bigger forest 
that is our world of international affairs. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Yes, I'm happy to do q and I, I should say that um, I'm conscious that some of you have traveled quite a way. I'm conscious that all of you know that there are drinks upstairs <laughs> and snacks, hot snacks, in a, a short while. I um, promise we will not overrun. We might underrun. Uh, see who among my former students is first to the bar. I have w one or two, I suspect, will be there first. But let me take a few uh, questions and a few thoughts and, and get feedback. I saw, yeah? Excuse me? Yes. Um, there's, there's a great uh, traditional British Foreign Office reply to any <laughs> awkward question like that, <laughs> and it, 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 it goes with great difficulty. <laughs> I seem to use it for everything, you know, uh, what's happened to my missing dog, where do we find it? Well, with great difficulty. Getting out of Iraq is with great difficulty. Uh, anybody who claims that they have the answer, whether it's slogging on forever, or oh, it's our colleague here at Yale, uh, General Odom, saying quit and run, you bet. Uh, none of those seems to me politically feasible, uh, realistic, and so we're left uh, in a really messy situation, and so will the successor administration be. Um, don't even ask me about Iran. Um, uh, we have enough acts of folly of the past few years without multiplying by two. Um, right now, I mean, I, I, I write a monthly column for the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune Syndicate, which is chiefly goes to foreign newspapers because the column is about 1,200, 1,300 words long, and American editors only want 600 words to describe something complicated like where's Putin's Russia going. Um, so I, I look back and see without any satisfaction at all that uh, I wrote against going into Iraq then, and I don't feel proud that uh, we got ourselves in a mess. Like that old saying, I knew things were going to be bad, but I didn't know they were going to be this bad. I'm assuming that there will be some form of staggered, phased withdrawal. I'm assuming that there will be uh, parts of the country which are relatively quiescent, largely because they are ethnically and religiously homogenous. I can't but think, though, that there's going to be an, still a continued amount of bloodshed, um, I'm, like everybody else, uh, goggling at what's happening on the Turkey, northern Iraq uh, frontier. Um, so I have no easy solutions. I, I've never met anybody who, that I've heard of in all of these conversations over dinner tables or whatever. We, we almost wrecked a Thanksgiving dinner in Boston last year by all of the members of my, my, my wife's extended family just getting so annoyed at each other about different proposals, and that's happening across the country. Um, I think we have to get out one way or the other. It's, it, it's not just contrary to the American traditions. It's just contrary to common sense. I'm not, uh, despite the Wall Street Journal characterizations of me, um, not a, 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 a British Labour pinko uh, or anything else like that. Um, I actually approach this with uh, rather as Kissinger does in the Bismarckian sense. Uh, if we brought uh, the German Chancellor back 
and told him about today's world and told him who the big powers were, my guess is that Bismarck would say, well, um, okay, you've got us stuck in Iraq. Uh, does Mr. Putin's Russia want us to stay stuck in Iraq? And the answer would be yes. And he would say, well, there's this big rising power called the People's Republic of China. Does it want us stuck in Iraq? And the answer would be yes. And then he would say there's this other big Asian power called India, which is beginning to spread its wings. Does it, is it advantaged by our being stuck in Iraq? And the answer is yes. And so Bismarck would say, well, if, if Russia wants us stuck in Iraq, and China wants us stuck in Iraq, and India wants us stuck in Iraq, and a lot of others want us stuck in Iraq, uh, it's time to start thinking of not being stuck in Iraq. So <laughs> how you do it is the $64,000 question. And you know, I, I still think probably we are going to end up following the proposals which uh, our former Yaley Farid Zakaria made in Newsweek uh, as long ago as about two years ago, which was we will pull back to a, a, a three or four or five fortified areas. And then we'll, um, and then we, we'll keep up with the attempts of training, rebuilding Iraqi security forces and police forces. But uh, all the public opinion polls say that month after month, we are less and less popular uh, in that country. I, I can offer a little solace here. And what's more, I think the UN um, can offer a little solace uh, either. Take another question. Yes, please. Uh, okay. Well, I share the characterization, uh, generally speaking, that uh, China, although its uh, ability to influence global markets and to play a role on the Security Council, chiefly negative, um, is large and increasing. It has not been, if you like, carrying its, its share proportionate to where it's heading. Um, that's not uncommon historically. I mean, in the, uh, in the 19th century, the United States, which was the booming economy, though it was a boom and bust and boom and bust economy, was definitely not carrying out its proportion of uh, international security or international institutional obligations. By 1914, the US GDP was equal to that of all of the European states, but it was not much of a player to the frustration of the British who felt they had to carry out roles which they would have been more willing to carry out if they had a US Navy which was willing to help them. Um, the US after 1919 goes back to play that rather negative or isolationist role. Um, so I don't think this should surprise us. Uh, what might surprise us would be to um, 
take a yardstick of China's responsibilities to or relationships with the international order in, say, 1995, and then come forward the 12 years. And uh, you'd actually have quite an impressive list. It would not be much in the way of intervention in the Middle East. The Chinese are too clever to intervene in the Middle East. Uh, it would not be in the way of much uh, Security Council contribution or peacekeeping contribution. But in the areas that concern the Chinese leadership now, I think rather significant step-by-step -step additions to, uh, including areas where we complained about 10, 12 years ago, intellectual property rights, uh, patent law, uh, law of the sea. The more that China expands in commercial and financial terms, the more it becomes a stakeholder in an international, stable, uh, commercial and financial environment. And it's more, uh, if, if uh, that weird book called The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers has any validity in its arguments, it's that the economic and commercial and financial growth comes first before the greater international power role, which, which follows along often some generations behind. So I, I think what we're seeing is that China is um, it's still cautious. It's still neuralgic about anything which offends uh, chapter 2, section 7 of the charter about no interference in the uh, internal affairs of any of the member governments. Um, but it's now realizing it has stakes out there in Africa and in Latin America that it simply didn't have. Uh, 15, 20 years ago. I, I, I don't know. I think they're pretty good uh, card players. They know where their strengths are. They know wh what they want to avoid. Um, my concern is that we may have a government in Washington which really doesn't get the priorities right. I agree with you that China is incredibly important. Yes, ma'am? Could you speak up? Yeah. Oh, yes, sure. This is a Gus Rayner's question. Well, I, I'll try to uh, repeat what you said in your two-headed question as I attempt a stumbling answer to it. Um, I have no idea whether the U.S. government uh, is secretly quite happy as the dollar goes down in international value. Most of the financial press at the end of last week had op-eds in from international economists, monetary economists and bankers saying that it will go down further. Uh, I don't see this, uh, you know, stopping Mr. Cheney from shooting all over his Texas ranches on the weekends. He's not losing <laughs> sleep about that. Um, and it, and it, it is not surprising to me that certain other governments think that this is deliberate or intentional. And the US is just not going to do it because it will benefit uh, Boeing vis-a-vis -vis Airbus in sales of very large uh, aircraft, dollar denominated or euro denominated. Uh, as you well know, the French, especially among the Europeans, are a bit incess incensed about this now. But I, I don't know. Uh, frankly, I'm not quite sure if the US Treasury 
or the Federal Reserve Bank possesses the instruments or the freedom of maneuver to which would cause a rise in the value of the dollar. The only way I can see is from my crude learning of economics would be a significant rise in interest rates which would drive the Congress nuts and would definitely put us into a recession in various already troubled parts of the economy. So I don't see it happening. You said what um, did I learn or what did I come away thinking about what the international community could do in response to some of these big transnational challenges which were described in the report um, but, uh, and which I've tried to illustrate here. Um, Mike, I, I came away with the conclusion that, um, first of all, uh, we're going to have to be a lot smarter and a lot more realistic. Our Yale Ford report on the, you know, the United Nations in its second half century, we were under instructions from the great German uh, Bundespräsident von Weizsäcker and from the, uh, the other co-chairman was the... Uh, wonderful Pakistan prime minister who took Pakistan from military rule to democracy, Maureen Qureshi, we were under instructions to draft a very radical structural changing report, and so we did. You know, adding a whole number of countries to the permanent veto status on the Security Council, getting rid of ECOSOC. Uh, what, what I and Bruce came to see was that changing the uh, charter, changing the constitution of the UN is not the way to go. It's much easier to change the US constitution, believe me, than it is to change the charter. The only one change occurred, over, I think, 1964-65, raising the number of rotating seats on the Security Council from the original six rotating seats with the five permanent, raising it from six to ten. We've never done a change in U.S. Charter since then. If you look at the conditions for getting a change, which at the very end of the Charter, you'll understand why it's such a big hurdle. So if you're going to improve things, you're going to have to think of what do you do practically in a whole variety of areas, whether it's peacekeeping, intelligence gathering of impending crisis, pre-positioning of forces, medical supplies, um, various other responses so you're not continually taken by surprise. The only people who've done this seriously are our northern neighbors, the Canadians. Up at Fredericton and New Brunswick, they have pre-positioned two battalions trained for international peacekeeping and police force. So if the sovereign Canadian government is asked by the poor secretary general who has to go around with his cap in hand whenever the Security Council announces a new mandate, if the sovereign Canadian government says, okay, we can send one of our battalions, it can be out there in 36 hours. This is what the Canadians learned from the dreadful, shameful experience of uh, General uh, Dallaire in Rwanda, Burundi in 1994. You've got to be ready. There are all sorts of ways which Professor Rennes knows much better than I of improving coordination between the economic and social agencies. There are, there's much work and much really good work on the ground being done in that realm which I try to describe probably not very well in chapter seven of my book the, which is on the role of international civic society the NGOs, the churches, the liberal foundations. It, it's really surprising that uh, when you go to somewhere like Kenya or the Caribbean, it's not just the World Bank doing something or the UNDP. It's probably about 20 other groups and organizations, many of them increasingly cooperating with each other or sharing information. So I'm not... Um, no, I'm not pessimistic about pushing forward at the practical level. I'm truly pessimistic about any change in a constitutional alteration of the Charter because the hurdles, the twin hurdles, are just too bad. Yes, please, sir? Uh, 
This is not my uh, field at all. I'm almost inclined to say I, I pass. Are you, is your question whether the sheer size of those goods and services could be amended in some legal way, taxation way, structural way that might be a reinforcing element to the need for international cooperation? Ah, well, I'm, I'm really pleased. <laughs> but, but you have described the necessity for economic improvement in yep. a number of societies. And it seems to me that the $2 trillion from the United States buyers dwarfs any other supply of economic resources. Uh, and the Europeans do about the same. So, so can this be taxed to fit into the three-legged stool? Well... You know, some economists would say that simply the year-on-year -year growth of the U.S. economy and of the European Union itself is assisting uh, many, many poorer countries because of the demand for raw materials. I mean, look at the price of copper or vegetable oils or many other of those things which, of which the... The, the extractors or the producers are located in uh, developing countries, which have seen a significant shift in their inward capital flow because they have these resources. Now, the environmentalists would get rather worried about that, so it's, it's a more complicated business. Uh, if, if, if you meant other than... There are two other things which, which may be in what you're thinking about and what I'm stumbling to reply over. One is, um, can we increase and use more intelligently our USAID or other foreign aid? And I think the experts in the field would come up with half a dozen nifty ideas in which we could use it, and they would, but they'd uh, annoy a large number of Nebraska farmers because it would be about using aid not just to purchase American foodstuffs, but it would be using aid for infrastructural development or health care development. There was an idea uh, floated uh, here about 15, 18 years ago, which again Professor Reynolds will recall, which was since the world has globalized and since uh, there are enormous flows 24 hours a day around our planet of capital and therefore currency exchanges, why not a really, really minimal tax? Uh, the Tobin tax, named after our great economist James Tobin. Why not a minimal tax, you know, tax of like 0 0.01 cent on every dollar of things which were exchanged? Uh, Tobin, I believe, was thinking of that tax, whatever the rate it was to be, as something which would uh, inhibit or deter currency speculation rather than be a source of income for international purposes. But the Tobin tax idea was picked up by a large number of uh, international organization reformers in the early 90s. Uh, who thought that this would mean it would generate, even though the tax itself would be very small, the volume of financial exchanges was so large, it would generate a pretty decent flow of funds which could go via the Bank of International Settlements to the United Nations budget and take some of the burden off nation states. The result of that in this country was expressions of utter outrage and venom from the US Congress. It was not then paying our internationally due contributions to the UN budget, uh, but it didn't want to see any alternative source of income to the international organization. It wanted to have the power of the purse and the power of stranglehold. So that idea, which may have led to possible flow, possibly larger flow of funds, died in the dust around about 1994, 1995. I've not heard it raised again. So uh, I think you have um, 
the two the two answers which would come back to you putting aside this international tax response would be that we actually do the best when we keep our trade barriers low and purchase from the uh, outside world. And secondly, we could do a better job with the allocation of the funds which are technically there in the Congressional Budget Office record of how much foreign aid we give each year. I can take one more question, I think, and then definitely not get in, in between you and your drinks. Yes, ma'am? Yes, accepting your premise that the uh, United Nations is paralyzed as to its function uh, as the sort of political body of the world order, um, uh, do you foresee um, other organizations arising parallel to the UN, or are we heading for some kind of world anarchy? Well, um, let's try and pass that a bit. I don't think the world, uh, if we're talking about the big powers and therefore the permanent veto powers, the five on the Security Council, they are not necessarily paralyzed. Uh, the, they have immense powers as given to them in you know, chapters five, six, and seven of the UN Charter if the big five and then a majority of the others vote for a certain thing or demand a certain thing or mandate a certain thing, by international law and by the fact that every one of 192 nations signing into the charter said it would obey the Security Council, it's, um, it can do anything. What's happening, as I think you suspect and know, is that some of the great powers, some of the veto powers say, well, I don't mind you going into Sierra Leone because I don't care about it, but don't even think about Tibet or Chechnya or somewhere like that. So the great powers do cherry picking. And that leads to enormous amount of disillusionment. It therefore, if you think it through a little more, it means that the interesting reform proposals for increasing the number of permanent veto powers uh, may, make it, may make the Security Council look more representative if it had, say, India, South Africa, Brazil as permanent members. But it would mean there were eight big powers who could do the cherry picking or could put a, you know, a stick in the spokes of the wheel which is why some smaller countries like Singapore are against anybody else getting a permanent veto seat. It would just make it more difficult to get consensus. But I repeat my point, if they come together, if they agree on it, if uh, especially the P5 ambassadors walking down the corridor agree that with a little change of the language on this resolution here or that mandate there, China will drop its objection then they can get things done. Second part, very briefly, um, if it is paralyzed by this constitutional capacity of negativism, they have negative powers, not positive powers. If it's paralyzed by that increasingly in the future, will we look for other ways of solving problems or will we look for other structures? I, I don't think we will look for other structures. There may be a more coherence and more commitment by regional organizations, which are already there. The Organization of African Unity, for example, could do more if the sovereign states of the organization wanted to. Uh, but I don't think there's going to be in some new, you know, this, this uh, odd proposal that we create a, a world coalition of the willing. I think right now, given the state of our uh, popularity in the globe, the coalition of the willing would be a very, very small group of states in any case. But I think what's going to happen is somewhere along the lines of what I suggested um, a few minutes ago, which is if, if the central part, if the Aulic Council of the Holy Roman Empire isn't functioning very well, then how do you deal with this or that problem in the Rhineland or Bavaria or in the Baltic? 
And what, what will happen is translating that from the 18th century to the 21st century, you'll, you'll look for practical ways of doing it. And so I end a, a little bit more hopeful on the peacekeeping part than uh, some of you may think I should be. Uh, we were involved, a number of us were involved in the early to mid 90s in producing reports to the Secretary General. Uh, one of the first of which was called An Agenda for Peace. Then there came the Agenda for Development, then there came the Agenda for Democracy. The Agenda for Peace assumed, the, the document of 1992 assumed a sort of template of how to respond to a security crisis. That is to say, you would invoke Chapter 6 of the Charter, and the, the Secretary General would use his good offices or send a special diplomat negotiator if the sides didn't agree, or if one side began fighting. Uh, you would then move to economic sanctions, and then you start moving up the ladder to peacekeeping. And if they got really bad and started attacking the blue helmets, you would go to peace enforcement. And there was your template. It was pretty much destroyed by what went on in the Balkans, Central Africa, and Mogadishu. Uh, people thought that peacekeeping was then totally finished. And actually, for a year or two, it was. The Security Council backed off mandating any peacekeeping or peace enforcement. And then it started coming back, looking at the charter, which is very nifty and nuanced about what the Security Council may do, who it may ask in. And it began to use some of the parts of the Charter which hadn't been there. If an individual member of the Security Council wished to go to the Security Council and ask and volunteer to lead a mandated UN operation, the British in Sierra Leone, the Australians in East Timor, and then produced a local coalition to follow it, its lead there, and if the Security Council gave its blessing, it could do it. If a regional organization volunteered to try to deal with some crisis in Central America or Africa, it also could do it. So I, I guess the, the one part of my mind which is not numbed by pessimism over our 21st century, the one part of my mind is that there actually have been a number of practical people thinking of practical on-the-ground solutions. They're not a big template for all. Uh, they don't work in some parts of the globe. They work pretty well in other parts of the globe. And I think that's going to be the story of the 21st century, just like economic advance and development is going to be a partial one. Some areas will find it much easier to become prosperous and others. Some will find it that they can become stable and free of war. Let's hope so. Can Next. I use my position to ask you a question? Even though I know the people from... You know, it's from he... The, one, one, one he kept question. you from your drink. <laughs> <laughs> the question is this. Uh, if we are facing non-state antagonists down the road, as yep. it looks like, and given the fact that we're going to be unable to do anything about the UN, as you point out, it seems to me, although I like to be uh, end on a positive note as usual, it seems to me the real risk is that NATO will be the instrument where we don't have to worry about veto powers and the hegemon will use NATO to impose its will wherever we feel the necessity to do so. Uh, I think that's right, and uh, I, sh I should have said that among the different instruments being which, which was looked at from uh, the 1993, 94 onwards were regional defense organizations. You can actually point to some of the later wording in Chapter 7 of the, uh, of the UN Charter where it says using regional organizations. Um, but we're in danger of abusing that if it's used just because the Pentagon and the White House don't want to have an operation under the Department of Peacekeeping, 
and the UN and don't want it under the Security Council, and so they invoke this to get NATO operations in the Balkans, and NATO operations in uh, Afghanistan, and may invoke it in, in various other places. So I, th this is a uh, two-edged sword. I don't think anyone would protest at the use or deployment of NATO forces in the Balkans to bring peace there. But everybody also understood it was a hegemonic powers decision because it wanted to use NATO headquarter and organizational structures, which it knew about and which it would be co in control of. So there is a danger which many Europeans apprehend of NATO being regarded simply as an American tool for US interests in different parts of the world. And you know, it, it does look as if uh, the, we should get rid of the North Atlantic part of the NATO acronym, the wider and further we go afield. So I, I think it's a risk, Gus. I just think it will all, it, it, we should not be surprised if it's invoked again or tried again uh, by future U.S. governments. Thank you.